So at this point, I'd like to introduce Shane Farber. Shane is a member of the Weber State community. He is the director of marketing and communications for our online and continuing education department. Did I get it? Program? Very close, okay, great. Um, and it, for me, over the last year, having the opportunity to work with Shane has been an honor. One is new faculty in terms of him opening up doors uh, and resources to me that I didn't know exist. And then the opportunity to make sense of a story. I'd like to just briefly share before I formally bring Shane up here that um, about 16 months ago, uh, I am a climber myself. And I was rock climbing at our, one of our local climbing gyms um, with a fellow faculty member. And we were getting ready to leave. We had finished climbing for the morning. And we heard a sound and saw something out of the corner of our eye that I will never forget. Just by chance, I happened to be at the climbing gym the morning that chain fell. At that time, I didn't know that Shane was a colleague of mine. We, the, uh, we were trying to put pieces together and be part of an emergency response situation. It was several months later that I was meeting with a, a staff member uh, in the marketing, uh, our online programming uh, continuing ed department. And she had talked about one of her colleagues. And we started putting pieces together uh, that, oh my gosh, this was Shane. In that moment, it was incredibly humbling for me. And also, um, I felt the need to talk to Shane. With that being said, I let that just kind of go, and then it was a couple months later, and actually Shane reached out to me about wanting to potentially have a voice to tell a story at the festival. And I'll never forget that first meeting that we had in your office. I was nervous. I was humbled, and I didn't know what I was going to say. Because at that point, Shane didn't know that I was there that morning. We had not made that connection. And so our conversation began, and I shared that. I shared that I had this experience, and I was there. And uh, I am just so grateful that we were able to have that conversation, and that we were able to be here today. We don't know often how the moments will change like that in our life. And most of us probably have had a situation where something happens within a blink of an eye. It makes us think very deeply about our current life circumstance and the people that we love and that we care about. And so I hope that as you listen to this story today, you think back to the slide, the final slide, and, and, and the wisdom that was just shared by, our, by my fellow faculty. Stories are incredibly powerful. They are part of our lives. They are integral to the human spirit and tenacity and pursuit. And so with that, I would like to formally introduce Shane Farber. Thank you both. See that? Four stairs, no handrail. Um, I want to thank the Storytelling Festival for allowing me. Can you hear me okay? Do I need to adjust this at all? All right. I want to thank the Storytelling Festival for giving me this chance to share my story with all of you. I want to thank the people who have been part of my recovery from the day of my accident to now. Um, over the past year and four months-ish, <laughs> I've been on a very wild ride uh, called Living with a Spinal Cord Injury. So. I'm here to talk about that story today, and uh, hopefully we can find some common ground through that story. I hope you don't mind my hovering near the podium. I still get a little bit shaky on my feet sometimes, so you know, to avoid sprawling on the ground, I think I'll hang out right here. In the outdoor community, we often talk about two types of fun. Type one is your standard fun. You wake up to sapphire and cotton candy skies and you head out on your favorite mountain bike trail. 
You swoop down a winding bit of single track. You feel strong, but challenged. You see a moose, but from a safe distance. You're covered in the right amount of dirt. You drink a celebratory beer, or other beverage of your choice. <laughs> Type two finding is a bit different. You find that your favorite mountain bike trail is rutted out because somebody before you just couldn't wait for the spring mud to go away. You try to cruise down that winding bit of single track, but the ruts catch your tire, and you perform an endo. That's mountain bike speak for sailing over your handlebars. <laughs> you see a moose from an unsafe distance. <laughs> You're covered in the wrong amount of blood. Somehow, you survive, and somehow, it was still kind of fun. You drink a beverage of your choice. Mine's beer. <laughs> For most of my adult life, through type one and type two fun, I have found my joy and meaning in the outdoors. Whether it was backpacking through the incomprehensible towering peaks of the Wind River Range, floating the fiery canyons of the San Rafael Swell, or just an even ma evening mountain biking on the accessible Bonneville Shoreline Trail, just right outside of campus here, I was most at home while playing away from home. Whether it was rock climbing, mountain biking, road biking, fly fishing, backpacking, or any other manner of adventure, I had my fair share of both types of fun. I didn't know that all that adventure was preparing me for a different type of type two fun, living with a spinal cord injury. On November 6, 2018, my life changed forever. On any other day, it would have been nothing special. I, I can't tell you how many times I've taken a fall in a climbing gym. I have no idea, lots. But this time was different. Instead of the tug of the rope catching me, there was a sound. It was a sickening zip as the rope sailed through the quick draw carabiner on the wall. It was the sound of my old life coming apart. From about 30 feet up, smack. A crack, a shockwave of pain, numbness branching down my legs, my climbing partner gazing down on the wreck that I became, tears streaming down her face, scared climbing gym staff members appearing over my head asking if I needed help, an ambulance ride, a CAT scan, an MRI, Dilaudid, that's super morphine by the way, staying still, more morphine, getting the news that my L1 vertebrae exploded into my spinal cord, more staying still, more morphine, my mother crying, my sister crying, my father trying not to cry, my wife holding it together at least while she was in the room, more morphine, a little sleep, a wake-up call from my surgeon, eight hours of anesthesia-induced darkness for me, eight hours of hope mixed with dread for my wife and family. Then I climbed out of anesthesia. A tube was sticking out of the side of my chest because my lung collapsed during surgery. That chest tube wasn't working, a young doctor told me, and mind you, I'm still pretty stoned from the anesthesia. So they'd have to drag it out of me and slide a new one in. Through the fog of a local anesthetic, the new tube was threaded into me and then connected to a clear suitcase that soon filled up with pink chest cavity goop, which was displayed prominently next to my hospital bed. It wasn't a pretty sight, and neither was I. My feet looked like Cornish hens, swollen, turn inward, and largely inoperable. Bodily functions were largely non-functional. My legs were numb below my knees, and to top it all off, I was having a really bad hair day. <laughs> the following days only got darker. I had no clue what I would regain physically. Doctors couldn't really say either. Every spinal cord injury is so variable, so happenstance in terms of what you physically regain. One factor is the level of your injury. Mine, lumbar one, was in the small of my back and everything below the injury can be affected. I mean everything. Most able-bodied people focus on leg function. They don't know about the batter, bladder and bowel stuff. That's okay, I didn't either. Another factor is whether or not your injury is complete. Um, and that's defined as uh, severed or crushed uh, to a significant amount or incomplete, which is damaged, but 
you are allowed a better signal through that spinal cord. Mine was incomplete. Regardless though, you don't really know what you're going to get back. Wait and see is the mantra of the medical profession uh, that they often repeat when it comes to spinal cord injuries. I remember a couple days after my surgery, silently staring down at my pasty atrophied legs, tears streaming down my face. At that moment, my identity was shattered. And I was wondering, for the first time really wondering, what was going to be left to live for? I didn't have a good answer. <sighs> Spinal cord injury is traumatic for anyone, to be sure. For any dedicated outdoor enthusiast, though, it's a particularly cruel loss. For years and years, I relied upon my balance, my muscles and bones, to take me to stunning vistas that made me feel at peace and connected to the world and my fellow human beings. In the hospital, tucked away in a room with far too much furniture and far too many widgets and tied up to tubes, I realized that might be over. What then was left for me? I had never been in that situation before, or so I thought. How was I to continue living with a shattered vertebrae and a shattered identity? What I have learned in the year and some months that have followed, though, is this. I hadn't been there before, per se, but I had metaphorically been there before. I have begun to understand that I could draw upon the wisdom I learned in the outdoors to help me make it through this new type of wilderness. I learned the skills that I picked up outside of civilization, in the woods and on the cliffs, did indeed apply to the sterile environments of hospital rooms and controlled exercises on physical therapy tables. I am here today to sing the praises of wild places and to share how the majesty of the outdoors taught me how to get through this new way of living. Lesson one, know your limits, then push, push past them. When it comes to outdoor adventure, you need to understand what your limits and weaknesses are. If you don't, you're liable to experience intense consequences from the surprise realization of those limits. You don't just jump into an intense undertaking right off the couch. Well, here's an example. I love riding my bicycles, and that's plural. I have a mountain bike, a road bike, a touring bike, and I'm pretty sure I needed another bike, but my wife, Melissa, might disagree. <laughs> Bicycling is my thing. Among my outdoor pursuits, it's the one that I've done the longest, the pastime that I've loved best. I even have some bike chain grease tattooed on my leg. You wouldn't have known that, though, by watching my first few mountain biking experiences. Mountain biking is, ironically, a bit like taking up smoking. Uh, your first few times, you feel like you're going to puke and pass out at the same time. <laughs> Soon enough, though, you can't stop. You've spent all your money and your clothes stink. <laughs> I guess that's where the similarities end, though. I'd recommend mountain biking far more than smoking, and I've tried both. Um, there's something magical that happens when you feel totally connected to the graceful bit of machinery gliding under you, the strobe effect that comes from the sun glinting between the trees and onto your sunglasses, the grin that comes from grunting up a particularly demanding set of switchbacks. Smoking is just gross. <laughs> when it comes to mountain biking, though, there's a fine line between exaltation and devastation. If you misjudge a section of trail and your ability to navigate it, you'll pay in very real ways. If you're lucky, you just pay in scrapes and bruises. There's a section of the Wasatch Crest Trail called the Spine. It's a spooky, rocky, jagged section above Desolation Lake that I never did find the guts to try. That's okay, I think I, it would have ended badly and I would have quite literally left a piece of myself up there. So yes, know your limits, but if you never push past those limits, just a little, you'll always be constrained by them. It might mean some scrapes and bruises, but what's the acceptable risk? Acceptable risk is something we talk a lot about in the outdoor community. In pursuit of the next vista, grotto, or downhill, it's always a matter of figuring out the sweet spot between acceptable risk and the danger zone. It's not always obvious, but what do the grand, risky outdoor pastimes have to do with learning to walk again? Quite a lot, actually. Risk is all relative, isn't it? When you're able-bodied, a Rocky Mountain Bike Trail calls for your earnest evaluation. In the early stages of recovering from a spinal cord injury, so does a trip to the bathroom. I was in one kind of hospital or another for three weeks following my spinal cord injury. 
Actually, that's pretty short. A lot of people are in the hospital for months following their spinal cord injury, if not longer. Other than the two hours of physical therapy and some occupational therapy, I had to ask for help to get out of bed, into my wheelchair, into the bathroom. I met so many new friends while sitting on the toilet, by the way. <laughs> so many. Yeah, shame's just completely gone at this point. Um, in those dicey early days, I had to treat myself as gingerly as possible, as much as I wanted to just waddle to the bathroom on my own. Uh, one misstep could send me right back into surgery. What if I never pushed my limits, though? As I started my journey to walk again, I had to push past my preconceived notions, no doubt, and I again looked to the outdoors for my inspiration, which I found from a recent memory. In August of 2018, two friends and I decided to do a multi-pitch climb up the eastern side of Mount Ogden. That's the part that you actually climb and don't hike. Uh, we had to get there before the sun was up, and since the resort wasn't open, instead of a relaxing gondola ride, it was time to schlep up the service road for a couple miles until we got to our climb, unload everything, rope up, and then climb seven pitches to the top. Nerves had made my sleep scarce. The climbing, while te not technically difficult, was demanding enough. Then came the tricky part. Three of us were tied together with two ropes. The first rope was 70 meters. The second, 60. My good friend, who was leading the climb, accidentally shot past the anchor point. And uh, what that translates to is that his rope would reach the anchor, mine would not. I remember him yelling down to me, is the rope out? Yeah, that means you're not gonna make it. That's right. <laughs> so I had to figure that out. Um, took some time. Uh, it took some inventiveness to be sure. I won't go into the details, but at one point I thought I might very well spend the night up there on the mountain. As the sun set, we did finally crawl up to the radio towers and then hike down in the dark. I started to drive home after, after, but I ran out of all my steam at 10 p.m. at a park and ride lot. Then I called my wife to pick me up. Thanks, honey. I definitely went past my limit that day. Imagine my surprise when, just a few months later, I felt that same sense of dread, excitement, and exhaustion from a set of, a set of four steps with a railing. It was my first real challenge at the rehab hospital after my accident. Four steps up and down while grabbing onto a rail. I experienced mounting terror as I gingerly placed my th numb foot on the first stair, then began to weight it. My toes could not bear weight, so I basically just pulled myself up the steps, and then when it came time to go back down, I just kind of slopped down and held onto the railing for dear life. Sweat was dripping down my face by the time that round was over, and then I did it again. I pushed past my limit. I went beyond one set of stairs and did several more. Nevertheless, it felt so infinitesimal to what I had been doing previously. I now realize that I was looking at it all wrong. I was taking the same approach that I'd always taken while exploring the outdoors. I was finding where my limit was, then attempting to push ever so slightly past it. Sure, my limits were radically redefined for me, but there I was, nudging them into new territory nevertheless. That notion has brought solace. Are my physical abilities different now? Yeah, absolutely. But I'm still pushing and pushing and pushing past those limits. Before you start thinking that it's all a matter of risk taking and willpower though, I'm, I think we need to address the second lesson I've learned from the outdoors and that is, you are not totally in control. With a spinal cord injury, you can only push as far as your body will allow. At its core, my injury is a signal problem, not solely a physical or mental strength problem. You can have all the willpower in the world. Unless your brain agrees with your body parts that those body parts should move, well, you're out of luck. Now you can work on that, but it's stubborn and there aren't any guarantees. The bottom line is I've worked hard to reach where I am today, but that's not all it takes. There are forces that are very often out of your control, much like you will find in nature. If there's one thing that makes me break out in a cold sweat when I'm in the wilderness, it's rolling thunder. I've been in a few lightning storms, you see. And there's something about a lightning storm that just kind of makes you feel powerless. Oh sure, there's the contradictory evidence or advice you can heed. Don't be near water, but don't be out in the open on land either. Don't be the tallest thing, but don't stand under a tall tree. 
crouch down or is it starfish out? I don't know. I was once in a wilderness medicine first responder course in which the instructor went through the usual repertoire of advice for a lightning storm. At the end of that, he said, but from what I can tell, with lightning, when your number's up, it's up. <laughs> Sheesh, you know, comforting. I mean, you can do smart things. Don't be on a peak in the afternoon, for instance, but nature is, by its nature, unpredictable. You can't plan for everything, there's no way, and you have to accept that some things are beyond your control. With the outdoors, you can't control your physical environment. With a spinal cord injury, you don't get to be in control of your body. Imagine that you would like nothing more than for a toe to twitch, and it just won't. Living with a spinal cord injury is a constant game of evaluating and understanding your circumstances. You can see me walking across the stage, and I'll go ahead and do that. I can do that. But I have a little bit of a limp. Otherwise, I look okay. Put some rock under my feet, though. It all goes away. I, I struggle mightily. The uneven surfaces of outdoor environments throw my limited sensation, paralyzed toes, and subpar calf strength into a tizzy. Staying upright becomes a sometimes Herculean effort, and two trekking poles are absolutely required. My ankles can give out without warning, and down I go. On an especially rocky tra trail, each step can bring a new challenge. As I've navigated this new way of being, I've reached back to my outdoor experiences, and the inherent unpredictability of the wilderness has guided me through this new uncharted territory that I'm exploring. Despite the stress brought on by unpredictability, I have also found my greatest peace in the outdoors. Moments are seared in my memory, nearly perfect moments, that I recall any time I need to draw upon that old calm when everything was right with the world. Years ago, a friend and I backpacked into Coyote Gulch. It's a stunning parade of red rock, cottonwoods, and meandering, burbling water in Grand Staircase Escalante. As we worked our way down a wash, then along a riverbed, the sun dipped and turned the monolithic sandstone grottos orange, purple, gray, then black. We set up our tent in the last light of the day and then sauntered over to lie on our backs and look up. Those grottos crested over our heads, giving the effect of being at the bottom of a humongous black bowl. Above the center of the bowl, the cosmos. I stared at thousands of suns for hours, perfectly content to push the rest of the world away. I've had many moments like that, removed from all else, taking in the landscape, and it taught me my next lesson in dealing with a spinal cord injury live in the moment. For the first few months of my recovery, living in the moment was all I had. Since no one could tell me exactly what movement I could expect to regain, I had to focus on what was in front of me day to day. Envisioning myself walking unassisted was too much to contemplate. As I would try to just stand, ever ready to grab the edge of my kitchen sink as soon as I began to wobble, walking on my own was nearly unfathomable. I had to focus on the seemingly minuscule task before me. Turn in a circle, stand up for sitting on a bench, do a leg lift. I had to drill down on each moment. The future was just too much for me to bear. Before my accident, it wasn't uncommon for me to live in the future too much. I was always planning to run away for the weekend. My wife had preferred a bed and a roof to a sleeping pad and a tent, so I often went without her. She was always good about allowing me to feed that side of myself, but I have to admit that I took her presence for granted sometimes. I always thought she would be there when I got home from my adventures. As I lay in my hospital bed mere days after my accident, I realized that being there is not a guarantee. My wife and I watched countless crummy TV shows while I tried to stem the ever-present, oh, apologies, ever-present spasms in my legs. We held hands and we didn't do much else. Presence, first experienced so purely in the outdoors, has taken on new meaning in the rest of my life. I could leave this earth right now for all I know. Uh -oh. <laughs> Nowadays, interspersed with pushing myself, because that's part of who I am too, I try to remember to simply be, at least for a little each day, and notice the warmth of my wife's hand just as much as the Canyonland sunrise. Speaking of days, some are still easier than others to be sure. Even now, coming as far as I've come, I have challenges that an able-bodied person does not, I now realize that even the most pedestrian of neighborhood sidewalks are way uneven. 
Walking is a mental exercise as well as a physical one for me. Many routines take dedicated concentration, which brings me to my next piece of advice that I learned from the outdoors. Life is a series of interesting problems. Recently, I was discussing my physical challenges with a new friend, and she, uh, she drew the comparison with climbing. She said, climbing is a series of interesting problems, and she's exactly right. For those who haven't climbed, rock climbed, I wonder if the pursuit seems purely a daredevil sport. And don't get me wrong, there is that element. Uh, when your belayer is made to look about a foot tall thanks to the rope of, uh, length of rope between you and her, yeah, your hands get a little sweaty. But that's not why I love climbing. I love it because it's a constant evaluation of your immediate surroundings. It's about feeling around for that next handhold, figuring out how to twist your hips into the wall to reach the next layback move, figuring out how to hang on for dear life until you can clip that bolt. It's about finesse, and it's sometimes far more cerebral than it is physical. I've been able to apply that same eagerness for problem solving to my injury. It used to be evaluating the next handhold. Now it's evaluating the next step I'm about to take on a trail, deciding if my foot will correctly interpret the rock below it. Sometimes I'll be wrong and down I go, but I learned from those mistakes just like I learned when I took a big whipper on climbing routes. For those of us who live with different abilities, the world can throw all sorts of, quote, interesting problems our way, but here's where I want to draw a distinction between the beautiful indifference of wild places and the beautiful human race that we're all part of. So let's do a quick comparison exercise. This is me just a couple days before my accident. This is me the day after my accident. This is me sometime before my accident. And this is me after my accident. This is me before, and lo and behold, this is me after. This is me before, and this is me after. And before, thank you. Before we get too inspirational though, I need you to know that I tried skiing for my first time after my accident on Saturday and a two year old cut me off. <laughs> you just gotta take it easy, you know, be humble. Um, I didn't get to this point through sheer, sheer willpower. I got back to the things I love because I was and am surrounded by people who ask how rather than saying no. When I asked how I could walk my dog again, my therapist at NeuroWorks, which is a spinal cord injury rehab in Sandy, excellent place, first had me pull weights around and then I pulled a therapist around and then maybe, maybe I was ready to pull 60 pounds worth of Labrador Retriever mix around. When I wanted to ride my bike again, they ran alongside me until they knew I was stable. And when I said I wanted to hike again, they put me on uneven surfaces to get ready. I've had friends, family, and strangers all ask how rather than say no. I'm grateful and lucky to have regained the physical abilities that I have, but I hope we find a cure for spinal cord injury one day and each of us can push, push things in the right direction with research and funding. Until the day that that cure is found though, I leave you with this. As you now know, what people physically regain following a spinal cord injury is a roll of the dice. You may meet someone with an injury similar to mine who uses a wheelchair or crutches. Many of those survivors are trying just as hard as I am and sometimes harder. Many of them are getting out there too they're using adaptive mountain bikes and they're using other great equipment that enables us to experience the outdoors. We're very often 
not held back by any physical limitations, but by others saying no or can't when they should have asked how. All of us deserve to test our limits, live in the moment, and solve some interesting problems, even if we're not totally in control. Each of us has the ability to empower ourselves and others to seek adventure, and hope, hopefully we have a little fun, type one and type two, along the way. Thanks. Thank you.